Hello, everybody. Professor Brats here, history professor at Arizona State University. Well, a few months ago, I read a book by a very famous author, intellectual, named Thomas Sowell. And the title of the book was, or is called, A Conflict of Visions, published in 1987. I found the book so compelling that I've decided to make a video regarding it and uh, with one key difference and I'll explain what that difference is later this talk will be in my own words but based closely on the argument you find in in Soul's text we inhabit a world today of deep political division. Why is this? Why is it that when we debate somebody we disagree with politically, we so often seem to talk over each other, almost as if we're speaking different languages? The reason lies in philosophy. The root of our political divisions lie in philosophical divisions, often in ways that we are not even aware of. Granted, people, most people in fact, will not fall completely into one camp or the other. It may be by degrees. But at the poles of this paradigm, we have two competing philosophical camps. Two competing visions, realism and utopianism. And at the root of this divide between the realistic mind and the utopian mind are two competing notions of human nature. The realist believes that human nature is morally limited. Despite flashes of goodness, human nature has core elements about it that are inherently selfish, ignorant, bad, wicked. Not that there isn't good in man, but there is also inherent badness. Man has very deep flaws. Man has moral and cognitive limitations. And this is a fact that simply cannot be changed because it's in our nature. And so, for the realist, the fundamental challenge is to construct a system that makes the very best of the inherent moral and cognitive limitations of human nature. A system that provides incentives that persuade man to do for his own self-interest, which he inherently demands, persuade man to do for his own self-interest what he would not otherwise do for the good of the public. These incentives include negative and positive incentives. Negative incentives include punishment, social ostracism, Positive incentives include prices, the profit motive, social recognition that honors virtuous behavior. The best system, according to the realist, is a systematic process that is most conducive to achieving desired results. Again, through the use of incentives, indirectly because man's inherent badness means that he would not do so otherwise. And so the realist emphasizes, again, process, process characteristics. Examples of process might include property rights, free enterprise, constitutions. Through incentives, man benefits the public good not out of a selfless moral commitment toward a higher ideal of direct results, but rather man benefits society out of self-interest. And so you want a process with the proper characteristics to incentivize man 
indirectly benefiting the public good. Furthermore, because the realist is so concerned with process, the realist is also more prone to follow a rules-based system. Rules are very central to the realist because they provide stability to the process, which is central to the realist vision. Another thing that is important to recognize, the realistic mind is always eager to emphasize that even the best system, even systems with the best process characteristics will not achieve perfect results. Even the best system will have unhappy side effects, but this is unavoidable. You choose the best system and you accept that trade-off because after all, there's no such place as utopia. Well, what about the utopian? The utopian has a diametrically different view of human nature. For the utopian, man is inherently capable of goodness and self-sacrifice in the absence of incentives. Egocentric behavior is not a permanent feature of human nature. Not only is selfishness not inherent in man, but man is capable, the utopian believes, of moral improvement with no fixed limit. Indeed, man, the utopian believes, is inherently perfectible. Now, this obviously begs the question. If man is inherently good, why do we see so much wickedness, war, crime, poverty? If man is inherently good, there has to be some sort of explanation for these things. Aha! The utopian says, the problem is not human nature. The problem lies in institutions. Institutions are responsible for constraining and corrupting the possibilities of man. The, so the solution then lies in moral commitment, moral commitment to an ideal. This ideal is focused primarily not on process, which the utopian sees as too indirect, but rather on direct results. So rather than speaking in terms of process or rules, markets, property rights, constitutions, the utopian speaks directly in terms of desired results, income distribution, social mobility, equality, social justice. When results are the emphasis and not process, rules, according to the utopic mind, become a nuisance at best and intolerable at worst. The utopian mind tolerates rules so long as they don't get in the way of directly achieving desired results. As soon as those rules or that process get in the way, they become an unacceptable burden. And even if incentives do achieve desired results, the utopian is still uncomfortable with it because it teaches man that self-interest is compatible with the public good. And the utopian desires selfless, moral commitment to the ideal, to direct results. Well, let's dig a little deeper into the minds of the realist in the utopian. Let's explore their competing approaches to knowledge. This is very important. Because the utopian believes that there is no limit to human knowledge or human reason, it is very possible for cultivated minds, for intellectuals, for experts. Oh, in the utopian, they love experts. Experts. It's all about the experts. It becomes possible for cultivated minds to use their knowledge acquired through the limitless power of articulated reason to plan society, to plan results. Utopians and 
many intellectuals especially love the so-called social sciences. The idea that society can be understood and social decision-making performed by an impartial scientific teams of experts. According to the realist, on the other hand, man has inherent cognitive limitations. Therefore, the knowledge of any single individual or group of individuals is grossly inadequate for social decision making, even if that so-called in, uh, individual is an expert. Rather, knowledge ought to be systemic, a system or process in which knowledge is transmitted and coordinated spontaneously. Think of, a, uh, think of it as a, a very decentralized system from the bottom up, not the top down, created through incentives and process in which knowledge is transmitted by thousands, if not millions, of individuals, out of which emerges a collective systemic knowledge. So what are some examples of systemic knowledge? Probably the best example, to be quite honest, is prices. The price of goods are not dictated by any single individual or board of individuals. And when they are, like in communist countries, it turns out to be a massive failure. Rather, prices emerge through process, through daily economic activity conducted by thousands and millions of individuals. It is through this method of spontaneous coordination that prices communicate knowledge about supply and demand that any individual or group of individuals would be entirely incapable of discovering on their own. Economists call this price signals. But it's not just prices. Systemic knowledge includes cultural traits, which in essence, as the realist says, is the inarticulate collective experience of a society as a whole and not the articulated reason of a single individual or body of experts. So cultural traits, traditions are also systemic knowledge. Society is far too complex, the realist believes, for a single individual or body of individuals to hold the requisite knowledge to plan it. The realistic mind then is deeply skeptical of so-called social science. The realist looks at the social scientist and scoffs at his arrogance and pretentiousness to think that experts have impartial, perfect knowledge and that they can simply plan a society upon that. In fact, the arrogance of intellectuals and experts is so great from a realist point of view that the expert can become very dangerous in his own conceit. Now here we have a paradox because even though the realist believes that human nature is inherently constrained, the realist, ironically, has a higher view of the intelligence of ordinary people than the utopian does. Well, why is this? Well, the realist does not believe that there is a large gap of knowledge between the intellectual elite and ordinary people between the cultivated mind, so loved by utopians, and the common folk. And part of the reason that they do not see a large gap of knowledge here is that the realist does not believe that there is any large gap between the actual knowledge of people and the potential knowledge of people. The realist simply says that man, including elites and commoners alike, have natural cognitive limitations and leaves it at that. But the utopian, again, ironically, has a very low view of the intelligence and knowledge of ordinary people, especially when those ordinary people disagree with their goals. The utopic worldview sees a profound inequality between cultivated minds and narrow-minded man, as he sees it. But the utopian, again, sees this as temporary. Ordinary people have tremendous potential intelligence, he says, but they are victims of institutions, tradition, religion, cultural institutions, which hold their potential back and leave them in a state of ignorance 
and backwardness. It was Karl Marx called religion, the opium uh, or the opiate of the masses. Therefore, according to the utopian, the masses must be led by the few, by the experts, by an intellectual elite. It's really remarkable, actually. Just the utter disdain that many, not all, of course, but that many intellectuals have for common people when those common people disagree with them. So you see the paradox there, right? Quite a quite a uh, an interesting phenomenon. Because the utopian has a such a low view of the current state of ordinary people and a very high view of the potential state of ordinary people, but only after they've been properly cultivated. Utopians, therefore, are in, typically are in favor of direct action action conducted directly by rational planning and public-spirited reformers. Direct action, central planning, public-spirited reformers by the cultivated, by the enlightened, unconstrained by rules, unconstrained by process. The realist, on the other hand, has very little faith in deliberately designed planning. And when change does occur, and it's important to emphasize, very important to emphasize, the realist is not opposed to change. When change does occur, the realist believes that change ought to be evolutionary. Incremental change achieved through an evolution of incentives and process. Perhaps the greatest example is language. Language is an evolved process. English, French, Spanish, Chinese, Arabic all arose through evolutionary processes. Changes to the language are made gradually and incrementally, not by a single person, but by the uh, um, bottom-up collective whole. So much so that actually, you know, particular grammatical aspects of a language, I know this is obviously true of English, and sometimes appear to be quite irrational, but it, that's how it evolved. And he evolved over time in spontaneous fashion. Compare this to Esperanto, right? Esperanto, an attempted language created by experts in the 20th century. But of course, it utterly failed. Doesn't work. This brings us to another subject. Competing notions of time. The realist has a very high view of time and de-emphasizes moment-to-moment decision-making. The realistic mind lauds and reveres intertemporal commitments, commitments that were made at an earlier period of time. The realist emphasizes loyalty, contracts, constitutions, social traditions, the realist views tradition as a tested body of experience, as the collective wisdom of multiple generations collected over time. The utopian has a very low view of time. The utopian has very little patience for tradition. He views intertemporal commitments as burdensome, as a constraint imposed from an earlier time when knowledge was less, getting in the way of possible benefits from new knowledge. The utopian demands flexibility and a very remarkable degree of flexibility. This often puts a realist in a very defensive position. The utopian says, look, experts today in 2017 with greater knowledge than the past, they argue, say this. Well, how does the realist respond? Because the collective wisdom of the past, aka tradition, does not often include any explicit, articulated, rational defense. It's just how things are, right? And so this puts a realist at a disadvantage. The multiplicity of past experience is often too complex for explicit articulation. 
For example, why does a family exist? Why do we have marriage? Why does society deem men and women to be different? The realist can, can encounter great difficulties in answering these questions when experts suddenly arise to challenge it. In such situations, the realist responds that caution ought to be deployed. It's not that all tradition is automatically good. Sometimes traditions need to go, but the burden of proof lies with those who want to change it. And the realist says it better be a very high bar in demonstrating why this tradition ought to be overturned. For example, let's say you have Thinker X, right? Thinker X. And Thinker X inherits beliefs from the past. Well, Thinker Y comes along, and he lives in the same day as Thinker X. And he says, Thinker X, you're wrong. This tradition is unnecessary, ought to be overthrown. And Thinker X is a bit befuddled. He doesn't know how to respond. The utopic mind says, ah, we won, right? The tradition must be overthrown. The realist, however, approaches this question very differently. The realist says, no, 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 no. You have not won. It's not enough to defeat Thinker X. You're also contending, not simply with Thinker X, but also with Thinkers A through W. And so your burden of proof is very high. Now, it's important to emphasize that there are instances, as I've already suggested, where the realist agrees to change, often profound change, often rapid change. Take slavery, for instance. In this case, Thinker Y met the very high burden of proof, demonstrating without doubt that slavery needed to be eliminated. And that was a very drastic change. Realists were split on this. You had some realists who pushed back and said, no, 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 slavery's existed for thousands of years. It was, slavery existed in this culture and that culture and the Greeks and Romans and the, and the Arabs and Chinese, they all had slavery, blah, blah, blah. But other realists said, no, you know what? Think or why, boy, he's, I mean, he met the high, the high bar. Abraham Lincoln was not a utopian. Abraham Lincoln was a realist. So were most of the Northern thinkers. Nevertheless, the rule of thumb for the realist is that you better have really good reasons for drastic change. So far, we have quite a few differences between realists and utopians. Human nature, systemic processes, knowledge, and time. But what else? Well, the utopian and realistic minds have very different notions of equality and of power. First, equality. The utopian emphasizes results equality. Equality in the utopic mindset means equalize conditions. Furthermore, equality of opportunity means equalized probabilities that a person will achieve a given result. The utopian views inequality of results as profoundly disturbing and unnatural. Because it's unnatural, inequality of condition must be the product of institutions, of a social system controlled by rich and selfish individuals. This is why you often hear socialists say that capitalism is exploitation. From this perspective, the reason why some have more and others have less is because the rich have somehow taken from the poor. They have exploited the poor. That's the reason why there is inequality of condition. Even if there is no literal theft, which a realist would condemn because that would violate process, the mere fact that inequality of condition exists must mean that the poor have been exploited by institutions. The realist views, in, uh, views equality in a very different way. The realistic mind emphasizes process equality. Equal treatment under the law, for example, or equal treatment under any given process, regardless of whether or not the results are equal. In fact, the, real, the realist argues that it's inevitable 
that results will not be equal. What matters is process. And so long as the process treats everyone the same, there is, in fact, equality of opportunity. Unequal results is not the consequence of process, the realist argues. Rather, the process is celebrated by realists for mitigating inequalities, not aggravating them. This is why many realists will argue that the main beneficiaries of capitalism are not even the rich. The main beneficiaries of capitalism are ordinary people. The realist concedes that there are cases where certain unworthy people acquire great wealth. The realist will concede that. But this is a trade-off that the realist is willing to accept because the process as a whole functions efficiently. Now we'll move on to the question of power. Here again, we have another irony. The realist is much more concerned with inequality of power than the utopian is. The realist is concerned with a stable rules-based process and hence is greatly concerned with any effort by central planners to impose results regardless of process. The utopian, on the other hand, is not so concerned with this question of power or a powerful state. The utopian is so fixated on results equality that he is perfectly willing to grant enormous power to coercive state institutions. Results equality as it is at the forefront of his concern, even if that means that power must be exercised very unequally with an intellectually imposing equalized conditions. This he is perfectly willing to accept so long as it is done with good intentions and rationality. That's why you'll see a lot of revolutionaries in history. Robespierre during the French Revolution, uh, you know, dictatorship of the good, right? Uh, Marx talking about, well, the state will wither away, but in the meantime, we must have a dictatorship, right? Other communists spoke of a dictatorship of the proletariat in the meantime. The utopian will often say, look, the transition period might, you know, might involve some, uh, you know, classical tyranny, right? Uh, but so long as it's done with good intentions, so long as it's done with the longer view, the ideal in mind, this is something that we're willing to accept. And later that will fade away and we'll have harmony. We'll have utopia. This, of course, horrifies the realist because the realist understands that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, to quote Lord Acton. Because human nature is inherently selfish and bad, according to the realist, this creates a terrifying opportunity for wicked men to seize the reins of governmental power, leading in many cases to death, pain, destruction, and unimagined cruelty. If that sounds like an exaggeration, I mean, look back at history. The majority of governments in history, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, those adjectives would uh, apply uh, quite well to them. Even if a powerful government begins with good intentions, the realist says, it will ultimately slide into despotism and tyranny because power attracts people who lust after power. And who are the types of people who lust after power? Exactly the last people on earth you want to have power, right? Well, how does the utopian respond to that argument? The utopian says, well, not this time. <laughs> not this time. It's different this time. The realist replies, well, that's very naive. But even if you're right, and it's run by good people, and never slides into despotism, they still don't have the requisite knowledge to even plan such a complex society, so the point is moot. This leads to our last topic, competing notions of justice. The realist and the utopian view justice very differently. The realist has a very process definition of justice. Thomas Sowell gives us this example. Say you have a foot race. Well, if the foot race is conducted under fair conditions, process, right? you have the same starting line, the same finish line, these begin at the same, same time, then the result is just no matter what the result is. The utopian has a very results definition of justice. And this is often what they mean when they speak of so-called social justice. Now, 
granted. Sometimes the social justice people speak of process equality, right? In which case, most realists would readily agree. Um, but they would say, well, that's just plain justice. There's no reason to call it social justice. That's just classical justice when you're talking of process equality. But most of the time, or much of the time, what social justice really means is results equality, in which case the realists would reply, well, the realists would just completely reject that, right? Reject it as nonsense, as a Trojan horse uh, that will ultimately lead to inequality of power in government and uh, sliding into totalitarianism as results equality is imposed on, on the public. Well, I want to conclude the video today by um, briefly looking at two applications that do a good job, I think, of illuminating the differences between these two philosophical camps. And these two applications concern the topics of crime and law. On the issue of crime, the utopian is very concerned with the underlying causes of crime. Crime, he believes, is irrational and against human nature and therefore it must have special causes. Institutions, poverty, prejudice, mental illness, injustice, etc. The utopian is thus very hostile to punishment. They tend to view punishment as unnecessary or as a relic of barbarism, emphasizing instead rehabilitation. Rehabilitation of the internal disposition that will return the person to his more natural condition of decency. The realist, on the other hand, does not seek out any special causes of crime because he believes that crime is natural. People commit crimes because they are people. Incentives, then, are the process characteristics that will mitigate crime. And the prime incentive is punishment. Far from causing crime, institutions with a rules-based process help mitigate crime. The last application is law. Because a realist is so focused on process and on historical experience, the realist promotes judicial restraint. The judge is not to change or create new laws based purely on his own individual rationale. His duty, rather, is to faithfully interpret the law as is. If the system requires amendment, then it ought to be done through process. The utopian, of course, rejects this idea when process gets in the way of direct results. Changing the law or the Constitution takes time and is unnecessarily slow. Plus, the legislature might not consist entirely of men with the cultivated reason of a particular judge. I mean, after all, the legislature is democratically elected and the masses, they're just not up to speed. They're not up to par. The utopic mind then is far more open to the idea of judicial activism, which is a much faster avenue to direct results. Well, that concludes this video. It's a bit lengthy, I confess, right? But it's a good one, I think. Now, at the beginning of this video, I said that there were differences between this talk, or there was a difference, a key difference between this talk and the book. And that key difference is terminology. In a conflict of visions, instead of referring to the one vision as realism, Thomas Sowell calls realism the constrained vision. Constrained because that particular vision believes that humans are constrained by human nature. The utopian so calls the unconstrained vision. All right? And so I took the liberty of altering that a bit. But the spirit of the message is still the same. So, well, thank you for watching. And uh, I look forward to making another video again. And until next time, God bless.